Imagine the scene. You're sat in your office, it's 1993. Without a care in the world, you're reading a magazine and you find out that they've discontinued the Atari Falcon a year after you bought one. But that's not a problem, is it? Because these things last forever, don't they? Hmm. Not always. So when it does go toes up in the future, what are you going to do? Well, we have a couple of choices, actually. We could go with a second-hand Falcon and hope that that lasts a little longer. I mean, there's still Falcons in the field today working perfectly. I mean, they've been recapped 300 times, but they're working. Or we could go for a, what was back then, a modern hardware replacement, like a, a Milan 040 or a Hades 060, I think they were. But they were quite expensive, but very, very good. I mean, they had PCI graphics cards and all sorts of clever things. Or you could go for a Macintosh, a second-hand one, like a Performer 475. You could, and I'm going to show you how. Things look good on the Performer 475 in terms of specs. It has a 68LC040 processor. The LC, I think, was low cost, and that means that it didn't have an FPU, but that's fine, because neither did the Falcon. Mine has 36 meg of memory, which is more than the 14 meg maximum that the Falcon could notionally take. I mean, obviously, there were updates and upgrades that could take it past that, but they weren't stock. And interestingly, the Performer comes with 512K of 80 nanosecond video memory. And there was no corollary for that in the Falcon world, because in the Falcon world, video memory and ST memory, the law memory that is, sort of coincided. Finally, it came with a built-in SCSI drive. Now, I'm specifically talking about a second-hand Performer here, because back when the Performer first came out with that spec, you were looking at over 2,000 pounds. But by the time my Falcon had died, this would be way less than a new Falcon. So on paper, that's a definite spec bump, don't you think? So how are we going to do this? How are we going to get our gem apps from a Falcon to run on a Macintosh, which doesn't understand them? And the answer to that question, as usual, is emulation or kind of emulation. It's not the sort of emulation that you get using Hatari on a modern computer, but we'll get into that later. So one of the most popular uh, multitasking operating system replacements for the Atari line of computers, and that's from STs all the way through TTs and Falcons, was Magic. Magic was multitasking, and it came with its own desktop called Magic X Desk. So when the writing was on the wall for the Falcon, the authors of Magic ported it to the Mac. And it's a very glib, short sentence to say that. I imagine it involved an awful lot of work, but that's fundamentally what they did. Having the same processor architecture for the emulated environment as the host environment meant apps could run at full pelt. What uh, Magic had to do was then take over that little interface at the bottom and map, you know, read-write requests from the Atari side of the operating system onto files and folders in Mac side, and same for video, sound, etc. So because of that kind of abstraction layer at the bottom, when I said before it's kind of an emulator, I think that's because it's more of a virtual machine. We're here on the desktop of the Mac. I've set the resolution of the Mac to be 640 by 480 in 256 colors. And that gives us an equality with the highest resolution that we could get the Falcon to work with at 256 colors. This is just to give our comparisons a fair apples to apples capability. Now on this Mac, I have a folder with some ST software in it, which we're gonna install later. And that software, is taken from my folder that I use to install onto physical Atari lines of computers. There's no special versions needed for this. Okay, I'm gonna run Magic for Mac and let's just let it start up. What I'm not going to do is speed this up. I want you to see the, um, the length of time it takes to boot. And you know, while it's booting, it's doing the same thing it would be doing on an Atari. So it's loading the ROM, it's loading the bootstrap sector, then it's booting the applications in the auto folder, etc. Then loading the desktop and starting that up. And as you can see, that took about nine seconds, which truthfully, it's probably faster than it would be on a Falcon. So what do we have here, just as a cursory look over it? Well, we have a C drive, a D drive, and a U drive. The U drive is a unified drive, just like you get under Mint, which then allows you to access not just the C and the D drive as a subpath of that, but also to access things like the proc file system devices, etc. This allows it to have an ability to run uh, Unix tools. Now our C drive is our C drive. 
to install software onto. The D drive is actually mapped onto a folder on the Mac file system. So you can use that to get software on and off this virtual machine. In fact, you can do it in both directions. So we're going to hit Command W to go out of the emulator and in back onto the desktop. And we're going to have a look in the settings. Right, so if we go look in uh, the settings for drives, drive A is mapped to our physical floppy disk on the performer, and it will read and write ST format disks. Although I'm not sure about the more tricksy copy protected ones, but I haven't had a chance to test that. Now drive C, it says is mapped to a folder called Magic C. So let's just go and have a look at where that is. And if we go into here, which is underneath the uh, Magic folder with the app in, there's a Magic C subfolder. If we open that, this is our C drive on the Mac side, and we could add and remove things from here, and they would be added and removed from the Atari side of it. So back in the settings, we can see that the D drive is mapped to my Atari installers. Speaking of installing software on the Atari, there are two things that I install just about on every machine I go to that I'm using Magic, which is NVDI for graphics and Genie as a replacement desktop. And we're going to install both of those. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to show you the installation of that. We're just going to have a, a little bit in the background for flavor. Now, I find NVDI quite fascinating because this is the same installer that I use on my Atari, but it is aware that it's being installed in the Magic Mac, Mac and it is putting in drivers that use you know their video memory and stuff like that so it's actually um fairly tightly integrated and i think both of these were distributed uh, magic and nvdi is that is were distributed by ash software so i guess they cooperated very very closely so here we are post installation and isn't it pretty <laughs> i've created an apps folder and just stuck in a couple of apps that we're going to use for the purpose of this video there's the uh, calibus desktop publishing there's papyrus the word processor and Kronos, which is a back benchmarking tool. Now, now I need to be straight with you. This is not a perfect emulation and some things just don't run at all. So for example, if you have an application that accesses uh, the lowest levels of what it thinks is Atari sort of hardware, they will crash. So here we have sysinfo, which is a tool that tells you information about your Atari. But if we run that, we see this, it doesn't work and we quit it out. In fact, what I actually did after that was I just restart Magic Mac just in case it's corrupted something. Right, time to call in the benches. It's benchmark time. Now I'm gonna run the full suite of Kronos tests on both devices. So here I am running them on the Falcontosh. I'm not gonna show it running because it takes quite a bit of time. I'm gonna let you see the end of each stage of this as it counts down. And that's that. So now we're gonna go across to the Falcon and we're going to run the same set of tests. So the Falcon has an advantage here. It's running on top of a base gem. So there's no multitasking going on, no other processors potentially stealing the CPU. It's got 100% access to that uh, CPU and the video stack, if you like. Okay, time for a comparison. And it's interestingly not cut and dried. Processor speed, the Mac stroke Falcon Tosh, is about twice the speed of the Falcon. And that is not in any way a surprise because the Falcon had a 68030 processor and the Falcon Tosh has a 68040 processor. And the 68040 processor uh, had a more level one cache and it also had a pipeline architecture. Now FPU, if you look at this, is three times faster on the Falcon Tosh than it is on the Falcon, but that's a bit of a misnomer because this is running software floating point uh, emulation. So the increased speed on the, the Mac side of it, if you like, is partly that faster clock speed, the better architecture, and also actually bus access and things like that are actually faster. So memory and bus architecture, again, we have two times speed on the Falcon Tosh. Bus speed in particular is gonna be helped because the 68040 had a 32-bit access to the data bus rather than the 16-bit that was on the 68030. Now VDI is 11 times faster on the Falcon Tosh than it was on the Falcon. It's 11 times. But that, of course, comes down to the fact that the Mac had separate video memory and it had a little bespoke video processing chip, which I guess could paralyze, could parallelize some of those actions. But interestingly, when it comes to disk access, the Falcon Tosh is half the speed of the Falcon. Now, I found that really surprising considering the previous results. But I think in this case, it's almost like the, the previous thing where we're on about 32-bit bus access versus 16-bit. 
that the Falcon had an IDE interface that it was a 16-bit parallel, I believe, whereas this Mac in particular has a SPI-based SCSI implementation, which is only 8-bit data access, so that might explain the difference. I would also note that the Performer is running on a blue SCSI external uh, emulator, but I don't think that's going to be the thing. It actually performs quite well in normal things. I just think the Falcon was faster. Now, our final benchmark was the 3GL one. And this shows three times better performance on the Falcon Tosh, but honestly, that's just because it had three times better floating point. None of these have hardware acceleration for uh, OpenGL. I, I actually only think the OpenGL tests were really included in this suite of benchmarks for the, the later computers, like the Milano 4.0 and the Hades that had dedicated Radeon graphics cards. So therefore, you know, they could take advantage of this and then you could benchmark them relative to themselves. Okay, so that's the raw data. Question is, how does it feel? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you two side-by-side -side executions and you can see the relative performance of a real app loading real data. So first up is Calamus and this is the famous Aqua Flyer. So as you can see, the Falcon Tosh is actually finished and the Falcon's not really all the way through by any means. So here for Papyrus, and I want to note here that the fonts are different because the uh, Magic picks up the Mac fonts and gives you lots and lots of different options, whereas the, the Falcon only here has the default fonts that came with NVDI. But I don't think the fonts matter, but you can still see that the, the Falcon Tosh far out executes, if you like, the stock Falcon. We asked the question, can the Falcon Tosh outperform the Falcon? And I think the answer is simply yes, add a canter. I would buy one. In fact, I did.